On the internet recently, we will have all seen the pictures of beautiful places like Venice in Italy and Llandudno in Wales being reclaimed by nature, and heard that China's CO2 emissions have been slashed this year, both because of the current coronavirus pandemic. So you could be forgiven for thinking that this pandemic is a net positive for the environment. Sadly, that's probably not going to be the case. And in this video, I wanted to briefly explain why. Firstly, it's absolutely correct to say that China's CO2 emissions have been cut because of the pandemic by approximately a quarter, we think. And it's also estimated that global CO2 emissions have been reduced by about 200 million tons of CO2 to date. A lot of that has come from a reduction in aviation. There's been a reduction of anything between 50 and 90%, we think, in the number of flights leaving China, but also from industry. These satellite images show the concentration of nitrogen dioxide, NO2, which is emitted by vehicles, by heavy industry, and by power plants. As we are being constantly reminded, because CO2 is a significant factor in determining a planet's temperature, because we've seen reductions in the emissions of CO2 this year, we might expect to see a slight reduction in the planet's temperature. But actually, we're probably going to see the opposite. The planet's probably going to slightly warm this year. This is because industry and transport don't just emit CO2 and NO2, they also emit aerosols. An aerosol is anything that's small and suspended in the air. So it could be uh, partially burned fuel that comes out of a tailpipe of a car, or it could be black carbon, or soot from burning coal, or a whole host of organic sources like sea salt and pollen. The relative lack of aerosols over China can be seen really starkly in the number of blue sky days they are having and the improvement in air quality, which coincidentally has probably actually saved more lives than have been lost by coronavirus to date. Now, while carbon dioxide dioxide absorbs long wavelengths of radiation, which in effect causes energy to be trapped in the atmosphere, warming the planet. Aerosols tend to reflect short wavelengths of radiation, which in practice means they reflect sunlight. So by adding more aerosols to the atmosphere, you're actually preventing sunlight from reaching the ground, which results in a cooling effect. Whilst if you remove aerosols from the atmosphere, you see a warming effect. God, we cannot catch a break at the moment. On short timescales, the warming effect of removing aerosols from the atmosphere is going to outweigh the cooling effect of a slight reduction in CO2 emissions. So this year, we will probably see a slight increase above what we were expecting in the global average temperature. But will that translate into a long-term behavior? No. Probably. It is a near certainty that we will see a global recession or even depression because of this pandemic, which will result in large numbers of the recently unemployed staying at home, a downturn in economic activity, and so a downturn in industry. Naively, you might expect this to mean that CO2 emissions will stay low, and so with the transient effect of removing aerosols from the atmosphere taken care of, this would result in the planet either cooling or you know, reducing the rate at which we are warming. Sadly, however, there are three reasons why this probably isn't going to happen. Firstly, Chinese industry. China is where this pandemic started, and its CO2 emissions have been the subject of much attention, because Chinese emissions make up a very sizable fraction of the world's emissions, especially when you're considering exported emissions. So, for example, a consumer in the UK buying a product which was manufactured in China. President Xi has made it very clear that China intends to bounce back from this pandemic, and that will likely mean investing heavily in the economy to get it jump-started. Analysts predict that this will probably take the form of cheap credits being given to heavy industry, which will result in increases in the emissions of both aerosols and also carbon dioxide. This bounce back in emissions has historical precedent in China. In 2009, following and responding to the global financial crisis, China announced a titanic $586 billion stimulus package, a lot of which went to infrastructure projects, which meant a lot of construction took place which used a lot of concrete. And concrete has a very large CO2 footprint. So within a year, both the economy and the CO2 emissions in China were back on an upward trajectory. Yay! That brings me on to the second point, the global historical precedent. The only thing that's even vaguely comparable to this current situation, at least in terms of the climate impact, is the 2008 global financial crisis. In 2008, global CO2 emissions actually decreased, which contrasted with their previous year-on-year -year growth. However, by 2009, they had continued their vertiginous climb. They'd actually increased more from 2008 to 2009 than they would have done in the absence of 
the global financial crisis. This is because, in response to the crisis, governments around the world announced stimulus packages, and in some cases, they had heavy CO2 footprints. For example, in the case of China, that was because of the investment in infrastructure. So while the global financial crisis decreased carbon emissions in the short term, over the space of a couple of years, it actually had a net negative effect on the climate. And other things. As such, we can expect CO2 emissions to decrease in 2020, but then probably rebound in 2021. In a best case scenario, this will result in a slowing in the rate of increase of emissions, although still tiny compared to the actual amount of emissions themselves. We're comparing 200 million tons to date versus about 40 billion tons emitted over the course of a year. And in a worst case scenario, this will be like 2008, and there'll be more carbon emitted in 2021 than there would have been in the absence of the pandemic. Lastly, consider that we are going through the renewable energy transition. This is the replacing of old fossil fuel technologies for electricity generation, but also for transport and for heating and cooling with lower carbon alternatives such as wind power and solar power. Yes, for those of you who will inevitably ask, the nuclear power video is still coming, okay? This pandemic has slightly thrown off my plans for it, just a bit. So please be patient, it is coming. The suspension of industry has directly hurt the installation of new energy sources which are more carbon efficient, many of which are made in China. Solar in particular is absolutely dominated by Chinese manufacturing. So the replacing of our older fossil fuel based technology with more carbon efficient technology such as solar has been directly hurt by the pandemic and by Chinese industry being shut down. More generally, the renewable energy transition has been slowed by the pandemic, which will cause more carbon to be emitted into the atmosphere than if there was no pandemic pandemic and the transition I was proceeding at its previous rate. Now, considering the sheer magnitude of emissions at this point in history, every year that we delay the transition is a serious blow to preventing catastrophic anthropogenic damage to the climate. I could go on, I could talk about the complete disruption to science this year. I mean, even I was meant to be speaking at a conference that has now been cancelled. Uh, other scientists have lost an entire season of data collection in crucial areas like, for example, Greenland. And there's also been the incredibly worrying suspension of environmental protection laws all over the world. I am fairly confident that this pandemic will be a net negative, quite a substantial net negative for the environment. More carbon will be emitted into the atmosphere because of it, and we will lose valuable time in changing how society is powered. However, there is a potential positive outcome instead. Right now, around the world, basically all sectors are using this opportunity to reevaluate how we do things. People have demonstrated that they can work very effectively from home. We have exposed how criminally underfunded, in some cases, crucial sectors like healthcare and education are. And it would be extremely unlikely that we come out of this pandemic without significant, lasting societal change. It may well be that in the future, more and more people continue working from home, reducing the carbon emissions associated with transport, people commuting. People may also be more likely to support environmental legislation in the future after they've seen the natural world less disturbed by human influences. They may value it more. And in a global recession, it may well be that we actually see the renewable energy transition accelerate, as only the most economic of decisions will be tolerated by the public. And it is currently cheaper to build new solar plants than it is to maintain old coal-fired power plants. And with heavy investment in solar that has taken place recently and the associated infrastructure, it's overcome many of the problems of intermittency that have plagued it for so long. So maybe this is the moment when society takes the plunge, because it would be uneconomical to do anything else. But, and I would love to be proved wrong here, I just don't think it's going to happen. To close, I'd just like to quickly address something that I think will be said in response to this video. At its core, climate science is a balance between the intensely objective, this, uh, observing a fascinating physical system, and the very subjective, the very human view that we are so interested in the climate because we live here because our survival is so tied to the climate of our planet. And as such, you can't really disentangle the climate from the humans who study it. When talking about the influence on climate of any huge event, whether that's a war or a recession or a pandemic, please understand that this is driven by both the objective side of science but also the human stories. 
Right now, there are tens or hundreds of thousands of people around the world who are critically ill, and most likely hundreds of thousands of people will die. I've personally known people that have died from coronavirus. So when academics talk about the potential impact on climate, please try to see that this is motivated by a very human desire to understand and to safeguard our planet. It's not some cold, sterile piece of analysis. It's performed by scientists, some of whom will have experienced personal loss. This is real. This is human. I hope that you found this video enlightening, at least a little. If you did, then please do pop it a like. You can give it a share in your group chats. You know how YouTube works. If you would like to go beyond that, then you can also support me on my Patreon. Links down there in the description. Though I do understand these are incredibly uncertain times. So if you are watching this as a continued patron, thank you so much for your support. It means a huge amount to me. I hope that wherever you are, you're staying safe, you're staying at home, and that you're keeping your hands nice and washed. Thank you again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.